Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you all. Good for y'all to see me. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. I've had another good week and looking forward to another week. And uh, This time of year, uh, I've got a little chest cold or something, so I probably sound better today than I normally do. So. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not feeling bad. It's just got that little thing in my chest going on. But uh, it is good to see everybody here today. On the announcements, of course, we're still taking up collections and food, paper products and cleaning supplies for the pantry. Uh, bring those in and leave them in the back. Uh, stuffed animals, and school supplies, and spare chains. Uh, let's keep that missions going. Uh, I think it's been really good for our community, our church, and supplying goods for our community. And I think that's important. Also, next Sunday, we will be taking up a special collection for the people in Ukraine. Um, I can't call his name right at the minute. Ron Schaefer. Ron Schaefer. Uh, the missionaries. The missionaries over there have uh, sent Brenda and John a letter and talking about all the the situation they're going through over there. So, and he usually comes through about this time of the year and come by and visit with us. So, next Sunday we'll have a special collection. Uh, for the people of Ukraine, missionaries. Yes, sir. I wonder if we need to wait another Sunday century. Not many years today. I don't have a problem with that. Do it the first Sunday. Might, might get more. Uh, I don't see an objection to it. Let's just wait till the following. Sunday, which would be the whatever day that'll be. Oh, we could wait till that fifth Sunday, and uh, when did we say the next one was? April. 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 Is that too late, Brenda and John? John is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. They can use it just any time. In any time, so. Well, let's don't do it next Sunday, and we'll, if we decide to do it the first week of February, we'll make the announcement the week ahead so the people well, know. Just put it in the bulletin. Uh, yeah, maybe we drop it in the bulletin the, the week we're going to have it for the first Sunday of February, if that's okay. Anything else? All right. If not, let's turn in the hymnal page 57. 57, Dwelling in Beulah Land. And if you stand and remain standing for the affirmation of faith, let's just do the first and the last stanzas, one and four of Dwelling in Beulah Land. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Father God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and, <laughs> into your house and uh, gather together and to fellowship and to worship you. And God, I'm especially thankful for a community of believers where we lift each other up in prayer, where we share each other's burdens and join in each other's rejoices. And God, I'm thankful that I serve a God who cares so much about each and every one of us. That you're, you're eager to listen to our concerns. And that we can come to you humbly and boldly. Humbly because we know we can't do it. Boldly because we know you can. And God, I lift these prayer requests up to you. God, you know, and only you know, how to meet each need. God, I pray that your will be done in the life of each one that concerns us. 
And God, I, I also lift up the praise reports. God, thank you for what you've already done. And God, we thank you for what we know you're going to do. God, I pray that you be with us through the rest of this service, that what we do is uplifting and a blessing to you. God, as we just praise you for all the many things that you do in our lives. And God, just bless your, pray your blessing on this service in Jesus' name. in our hymnals to page three. Stepping in the light. And let's just do the first and the third verses of Stepping in the Light, page three. <laughs> John, a theme of, of focusing on the interactions between Jesus and the, and the people that he interacted with. And God kept speaking to me on this about this is an important interaction. This is one you cannot pass up. So here we are, John chapter 3. And if you notice in the bulletin and or if you look on the, watch the video and uh, see the description and the title, the secret conversation that revealed everything. So John chapter 3, we're going to start verses, in the first three verses, it kind of gives us the, sets the scene for us. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs 
that you, that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, secretly, privately, and likely without the knowledge of the other Pharisees or religious leaders. He acknowledged God's presence with Jesus, but he still lacked understanding. And if you notice here, Jesus cuts right to the point. It's almost an interruption. Because Nicodemus starts out with, we know you have come from God. We know you're a great teacher. We know you're a godly teacher. We understand that nobody can do the things that you're doing unless God's blessing it. And Jesus goes right to the chase. He said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It's almost like Jesus changed the subject. And you notice verse 3 where we get that common phrase, you must be born again. And you all have used that phrase before talking to somebody. Or you use that phrase, I'm a born again Christian. It's interesting because as I, as I did my language study, the word again that we see here, comes from the Greek word anathen, which actually means from above. Think about that. So when we read this passage or read that verse, I kind of have to ask myself this question. Have we been saying it wrong all this time? You must be born again. What Jesus actually is telling Nicodemus is you must be born from above. What does it mean to be born from above as opposed to being born again? And we get into that here in the next few verses. Because Nicodemus says to Jesus, says, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He goes on to say, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again, or you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. There is a difference between an earthly birth and a heavenly birth. The earthly birth is that fleshly birth, that body birth. The heavenly birth is that spiritual birth. When we're born in the way the world comprehends it, we experience a physical, earthly birth. As I said, our flesh is born. And being born from above is a spiritual or heavenly birth. But what does all this mean? What does it mean? Now let's kind of unpack this a little bit. When we experience our, birth, our earthly birth, that event is documented and records are made of it. Think about it. The day you were born, at that moment, there was no argument that you officially existed. A birth certificate was created. We each received our own social security number. And our unique identities were established. As I said, you officially existed. In that moment, you had a birth certificate, you had a social security number, you had a thumbprint, fingerprints. Your parents went to the courthouse or wherever and they registered you as a person of existence. Now, 
When we are born from above, we experience a spiritual birth because that's actually comparable. Because our spiritual birth is documented and reported. We're given a unique identity in Christ, complete with a, complete with a special set of spiritual gifts that are specific to our spiritual and ministerial callings. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and at that moment, our spiritual existence is created. There's even anticipation and celebration. Think about it. When a mother gets pregnant with a child, we have baby showers. A room is prepared in the home for that expected baby. We anticipate, we have doctor's visits. We try to figure out, is it a boy, is it a girl? What are we going to name the child? Is the child going to have a nickname? Grandparents get to argue over who's going to be granny and who's going to be nanny and all that fun stuff. When we experience our spiritual birth, there's an anticipation. There's a celebration. Jesus himself says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I go, there you can go also. He's creating a room for the anticipation of our spiritual birth. A room in heaven. There's celebration. Jesus specifically said, the angels in heaven celebrate for one person coming home. But understand, it is not until this spiritual birth happens that that eternal warfare begins. See, when you experience the physical birth, you have the flesh. And the flesh does what the flesh wants because the flesh has nothing to go against it. Keep in mind, you don't really fully experience spiritual warfare until you're spiritually born. You don't have that conscience hitting you until that spiritual birth happens. Yes, you have that tugging that's drawing you to Christ. But it's not until you actually have that spiritual birth, that birth from above, to actually come bad against that flesh. Because until your spirit is born, your flesh has nothing to combat against it. In verses 9 through 15, Nicodemus says to him, says, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. The reason people struggle so much with spiritual matters is because they refuse to accept the physical evidence that's right in front of them. Think about it. We see the evidence of God all around us. And there's so many people who sees the evidence of God all around them and refuses to recognize it, refuses to accept it. 
And if you refuse to accept the physical evidence, and trust me, there's, there's plenty of physical evidence of God if you're paying attention. And if you refuse to accept that, the spiritual evidence is going to be more difficult to accept. And as Jesus had this conversation with Nicodemus, and he's, he's talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus is an Old Testament scholar. In fact, Nicodemus probably could recite the entire Old Testament word for word and in multiple languages. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, he says, you know all the prophecies about the Messiah. That's part of that physical evidence. He was standing face to face with the fulfillment of every one of those prophecies. And he still doubted. The physical evidence was right in front of him. Yet he refused to acknowledge it. If we refuse to accept and recognize the physical evidence of Christ and salvation, how can we expect to understand the spiritual evidence? Jesus references to Nicodemus a time in Israel's history when their sins had placed them in grave danger of dying. He, re he referenced the, the serpent on the stand, where most had to create a serpent on the stand. They were being bit by poisonous snakes and they were dying. And they needed to look towards a representation of God to find healing and life. And now Jesus has come. And he's come as more than a representation. He's God in the flesh. Looking to him brings more than just healing and life. Looking to Jesus brings eternal life. And Jesus goes on, and we, hit, and we hear that popular verse that we have all known since children. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And he goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not judged, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. God loved his creation so much that he entered it in human form and sacrificed himself so that the relationship that we broke could be restored. And Jesus explains, Jesus did not come to bring condemnation or judgment but to bring restoration and salvation. In fact, when we look entirely at the entirety of Jesus' message, we see that Jesus really does not judge us. Think about that. If you look at this message entirely, Jesus does not judge us. We judge ourselves. The root word of judged in Greek is kritai, which means final determination. Think about that. Final determination. Because we all must one day make our final determination on whether we accept or reject Christ. We reject or accept a meaningful, meaningful relationship with our Creator. We must decide whether or not to receive salvation, the free gift of salvation, and allow ourselves to be born from above. Those who are never born from above will 
will one day unfortunately hear, depart from me, I never knew. And when you think about it, you understand how Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he can say, I never knew you because you never existed. You were never born. Spiritually, you never allowed yourself to be born. And if you never allowed yourself to be born spiritually, you spiritually never existed. And if you spiritually never existed, then Jesus never knew you. But you made that decision. God didn't make it for you. Jesus didn't decide that you're not going to be saved. You decide whether or not you're going to be saved. You decide whether or not you're going to be spiritually born. You decide whether or not you're going to be born from As we talk to our friends, as we talk to the people around us, as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they make the judgment. They make the final determination. We make our final determination. We judge ourselves. And each and every day, we judge ourselves as to whether we're going to live for Christ we'll let the flesh have control. But Jesus, as he said, I didn't come to judge the world. He came to bring the offer of salvation. He came into his creation to restore the relationship because we had no ability to restore it ourselves. question we all must ask ourselves is how do we judge ourselves? How do we make our own final determination? Let's pray. Father God, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this secret conversation that you had with the Pharisee that reveals to us what it takes to have a relationship with you. God, I pray that if there's anyone in this congregation watching this video who is still wrestling with their own judgment, their own birth from above, God, that they will reach out. That they will determine for themselves if they want a relationship with you. And God, for those of us who are already followers, that each and every day we will determine that we're going to submit to the Spirit and live the life of the Spirit as opposed to living the life of the flesh. Uh, we get to choose from two different lives each and every day. And I pray that each and every day we choose the spirit life. God, as we move into our time of tithes and offerings, I pray that you would bless this time, bless the offerings, bless the resources that you provide for us. Bless us as a church as we use your resources to <clears throat> Reach our community for you. God, give us wisdom. Give us understanding as to the best way to utilize our talents, our spiritual gifts, and our resources so that we can help those that we encounter make their final determination, make their own judgment in a way that leads them towards your salvation. Pray the saints in Jesus' name. Amen.
would turn in your hand move to page 203. Now my throat's about gone, but uh, <coughs> this is a little song my mother sang to me just about every day. So if y'all don't mind, let's sing this little light of mine. And just remember the good old times when we sang this years ago. And let's try to get all four verses in. This little light of mine, 203. <laughs> from your candle, from your light, and let it shine to the world around you. You're dismissed.